I'd like to welcome you here today to a conversation, a forum on amalgamation. And we're having this conversation on the, on the territories of the Lekwungen Masonic peoples. And I myself am very happy to be living and working here on these territories. Hi, I'm Larry Hannitz. Uh, I did get introduced earlier, but just in case you, uh, you uh, didn't hear. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. It's, it's great to see such a great uh, sort of, uh, audience. The order of the, uh, of the evening, um, uh, I'd like to introduce first uh, sort of, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Bish. Um, and uh, and uh, he will begin, followed by Johnny Carline. Um, and, um, and after that, then uh, uh, questions will be open. Uh, Dr. Robert Bish, uh, some background on him uh, as a professor emeritus uh, of public administration and economics at the University of Victoria, um, formerly co-director of the Local Government Institute at uh, UVic. He's academic chair of the board for the Tulo Center of Aboriginal Economics, which focuses on growing Aboriginal um, uh, First Nations uh, sort of, um, uh, economic power. And he continues the, the work that began in 1985 uh, to help get First Nations integrated into the BC local government system. He wanted, in particular, me to point out um, his, his, um, his earlier books because um, uh, I think he will, well, he'll comment on the reason for this, but the first book, uh, his first book on amalgamation issues was sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute, published in 1973. The second uh, was sponsored by the C.D. Howe, Howe Institute here in Canada in 2001. And then uh, the third book uh, was sponsored by the Fraser Institute based in Vancouver, uh, which should be out uh, early next year uh, in uh, January, I understand, of, of, uh, of 2016, with a focus on Greater Victoria. So look, look for that. <laughs> Maybe not, right? <laughs> Uh, many, he's written many other books and articles, including four editions of Local Government in British Columbia, published by the uh, uh, UBCM, uh, three reports on local government in the capital region in uh, 1999, and the 1999 Regional District Review for the, uh, the ministry. Uh, he is now retired, and which uh, is maybe one of the reasons why he can churn out these books and the like. Uh, uh, he retired in 1998, but... Uh, uh, resides here in, in Victoria in the summer and in Florida in the, uh, in the winter, so he'll be soon flying home. I might as well sort of go uh, to, uh, to st uh, on to speak about uh, sort of Johnny Carline. I think um, uh, what we've got here is a, is a great combination of, of academic uh, uh, strength and, um, and practical strength in, in uh, Johnny Carline in particular from 1996 to 2012. He was Chief Administrative Officer of Metro Vancouver, and in that position he developed uh, Vancouver's Sustainable Regional Initiative, an integrated plan, a set of plans covering land use, utilities, parks, health, housing, air quality, and food for the greater uh, Vancouver region, and obviously covering all of those issues, busy man. Uh, before that, he held a series of senior planning positions in Toronto, Vancouver, Richmond, and Surrey, and um, now he, was, he has retired to the, uh, the lovely community of, of uh, Machosan. So please join me in welcoming the two speakers and, uh, and, and Dr. Robert Bish to begin with. Thank you. I, I had the sponsors of that earlier work mentioned because it's really interesting that from the 1900 till about the 1950s, the main advocates of amalgamation or consolidation in the US were the Chamber of Commerce and the business community. And that has continued in many parts of North America. And yet the research on amalgamation is virtually always sponsored by the business funded think tanks, AEI, uh, C.D. Howe, Fraser Institute, etc. And what's even more interesting about it is some of the biggest consumers of the research are the small is beautiful left, the communitarians who want small responsive governments and don't like big bureaucracies. And actually when I was in, uh, in Washington DC for a while, 
I did a lot more testimony on behalf of the Alliance for Neighborhood Governments, which is about a left wing as you could get, uh, than we did for any of the, the business oriented. Local government is a very interesting area because what you're really interested in is uh, citizens grouping together uh, through municipalities, through improvement districts, through school districts, etc., to elect councils and representatives to make decisions on their behalf about services they're going to get. This isn't money going off to Ottawa or going off to Washington, D.C. This is going to be paying for things that, that come back to the local community. When we look in the 1950s, everybody tended to believe we wanted one government in a metropolitan area, preferably with a small board elected at large, and they would set general policy and the civil servants would faithfully administer all of the, the, uh, the services. <coughs> Unfortunately, in 1950s, there were some serious research began precisely to amalgamate all the municipalities in Los Angeles County very well funded by the Haynes Foundation. When they started working, they didn't find that the local governments looked like they thought local governments should look. They discovered contract cities, cities that literally purchased, produced nothing with their own bureaucracy. They bought their services from the private sector, from the county sheriff's department, from other county departments, from other cities, from nonprofits. And not only that, there was even an association of contract cities who shared information on who the best people to buy your services from were. They also discovered a whole bunch of shared services where municipalities had gone together for things like uh, recreation facilities, things like managing the groundwater basins, etc. And when they actually went and looked, they had been given a grant to amalgamate all these things together into one big bureaucracy, they said, that's silly. This is like a market. This is like municipalities agreeing with other organizations how they're going to do things. And it totally changed the way in the scholarly world over time people began to look at local governments. If I jump to British Columbia, well British Columbia was doing the same thing in the 1950s and 60s. We were creating entities like the Greater Vancouver Water Board, the, you know, the Greater Vancouver Sewage Department. We were dealing in collectively with the Souk Reservoir. We had the Victoria Public Library Association expanding to the four core municipalities. We had the Royal Theatre through the Intermunicipal Committee. So when you looked here in the 1950s and 60s, you, would, you had the, the creation, uh, not just here, but across the province of more improvement districts, more entities. They were coming to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs saying, we need a new organization for this. And what they decided to do in 1965 uh, was create one institution that would absorb uh, all of these variety of things where people wanted to do things outside their boundaries. And these were the regional districts. And British Columbia was sort of stuck this way because it had no counties. Almost all the rest of North America has a county where the county was taking over regional functions. Now, in the eastern part of the United States, counties are so small it takes five or six of them to do a, an urban region. But in the western United States, a lot of the counties are bigger than eastern states, and they, they really could be regional governments. But BC didn't have anything there. There were, there were no counties. There was nothing between the municipality and the province. The regional district is a very unusual organization. It's unique in combining three different things. The elected, the officials that govern the regional district are you, your municipal councillors plus the people elected from the unincorporated areas. So you don't have a second set of elected officials for your regional organization. They are the municipal councillors. Also, it can do literally any service that a municipality can do. So it's totally flexible. It did not get assigned a list of services by the provincial government. It got some that it could do. In fact, they got regional planning at the beginning and then they took it away because they used it to fight over tax base. And right now, about your only real mandate is you've got to plan for solid waste province-wide. And uh, there are some specific issues in some regional districts where we've got, what, seven municipalities got to deal with a sewerage uh, issue. Some have already dealt with it and some don't have sewers. But, uh, the third thing about it is they're, they're basically voluntary. 
you enter into activities that the municipalities agree, agree on. And yes, this occasionally leaves some free riders. If you remember when the Panorama Leisure Center was built, it was sponsored by Sydney and North uh, Saanich. And they, Central Saanich didn't want to join. So they just didn't let the kids from Central Saanich sign up for the sporting teams until everybody else had signed up and Central Saanich decided it would join. But we have some odd ones, like you know the, the housing trust. There's 11 municipalities putting money into the trust, which is a fund to help uh, sponsor housing. It doesn't pay for all the housing. It's to, to plan for it and lobby for it. Uh, but only three municipalities spend money from it. We do have some social activities that people are willing to, to put in. And then we occasionally get people that just say, no, we're not going to participate and they're going to be free riders. It's the nature of a, a voluntary system. Right now in Greater Victoria, about, and these are general because, you know, we're dealing with 13 municipalities. About 80% of the money uh, that is spent on local services is spent by the municipalities. And that's traditional miserable functions, you know, issue a dog license, uh, collect taxes, uh, maintain the voter roll, etc. Uh, the CRD uh, role in municipal services runs in a municipality, because um, forget about Salt Spring Island and the empty land west of Souk, uh, runs from about 5 to 17 percent, but it runs around 8, 9 percent on average of the spending in local services in the region is through the CRD. And uh, Souk is the 17 because Souk left a lot of services with the CRD when it incorporated because it was doing them jointly over a wider area than Souk city boundaries. So it left them in the CRD to do it with the adjacent part of the electoral area. Um, the rest really vary in the sense that uh, what they've chosen to, to do, you know, you've got the, all the recreation on the peninsula through the CRD. But the Western communities took their recreation out of the CRD and put it in the West Shore Park and Recreation Society. And so they have lower in the CRD, but more in another organization. The BC Transit, which again, the board, you know, is mayors and council. They do most of the local planning and then they negotiate with BC Transit because they got a formula for the funding. They're spending about 5% of the local government uh, expenditures in the area. Then we got the two libraries. We got the Greater Vancouver Public Library. We got the Vancouver Island Regional Library. And they're spending anywhere from 2 to 5% depending on the municipality. And then we got, as I mentioned, the West Shore. We got two other organizations that are trivial in expenditures, but, but they can be important. You know, Crest, the uh, CR Regional uh, Communication Service, and the Greater Victoria Labor Relations. And that's our local government structure here. You go into any other metropolitan area and the chances are you're going to find a lot more organizations around than that because they consolidated so many services under the CRD. The CRD runs about uh, something a little over 30 services for the municipalities. It's, got, it's responsible for staffing 43 different committees, boards, or commissions. And most of those are the same municipal councilors that, that were elected uh, and then sit on these other organizations. BC Transit is mayor and council. The library systems are councillors that sit on them like they're a committee. Crest, of course, has 50 different organizations involved, so there's a lot of non-municipal as well as municipal. And the Greater Victoria Labor Resolution Association has councillors, but it's got more organizations like school districts and, and so on in it rather than that. So that the, the regional district with that expenditure range around 8%, but ranging from 5 to 17, it's basically those decisions are made by committees. Because the board doesn't have authority over things where only a sub part of the, the municipalities are part of it. The people that vote on it are the committee of the people that, that, that are paying and, and getting that service. What's Interesting, if you go through the major facilities, literally all our major capital facilities are done jointly. You know, we have some rec centers in Saanich and Vic and Oak Bay Smart. You know, they got a bar so they can use user charges to fund a rec center in a small community. Uh, but basically, when you go look at the water system, the landfill, you look at things like the, the Royal Theater, uh, 
you look at the geographical information system, specialized things that you want to do at a larger scale, they virtually all gravitated to the larger scale. But what's different is the, the people who govern them are the same people you elect as your municipal counselor. What this does is kind of interesting. Uh, we have a very high number of elected local officials, 91 in 13 municipalities. This is high for here. Believe me, if you want to go into some metropolitan areas in the United States, you can find a thousand elected local officials because they still got a lot of governments, less than a thousand people. We only have one, what I would regard as really small government, and that's Highlands. And so you have created a culture where the elected officials are involved in everything. And you do not have major roles for highly paid staff to make the decisions instead of the elected officials. It's the elected officials that are on the committees. And frankly, we think the elected officials are stronger actors on the municipal committees themselves than they are on some of the CRD committees because we think some municipal councillors do not treat the fact that they're on a CRD committee as, as seriously as they treat their municipal committee. Mm -hmm. And that can allow staff to take over. I mean, I've heard stories of staff at CRD committee meetings having to be told to shut up because they're, they're trying to run it, take it away from the elected officials. It's a, it's a, it's a, this isn't that common in a metropolitan area to have such a community-oriented, bottoms-up government system. Because what it does is because all, you know, 10 of these or 11 of these are relatively small communities, although Langford's trying hard to get out of that category, uh, it means that cities like Victoria and Saanich pay more attention to their communities. And Victoria, you know, assigns a counselor to every community. They have actually give budgets to community organizations to be active. You don't find this a lot of places. If you go look at some of the data, uh, the cost of these counselors uh, looks like it's still going to be less than 1%, even with the recent CRD uh, doubling of pay. Um, those of us who work in this area prefer the, the system used in most regional districts. There's a very small base pay, and then you get paid to go to a meeting because the workload is really really different among different board members and a lot of the work is done on the committees not in the board and we like the system of uh, yeah you pay the chairman more and maybe the vice chairman but but you get paid in relation to your workload 17,000 is actually pretty high now remember our average municipal counselor is only making 16 and if we'd go across the water to Vancouver the municipal counselor is taking home what 83 so they aren't bothered when you only add five. Uh, here, you know, recently some of the counselors have really been busy with all of the meetings on things that they've not been able to bring to a conclusion. But what you, what you will notice, uh, in general, if we go over to the, to the lower mainland where our, other, where our big cities are, uh, they can run their elected officials and the support, the expenses, the sort of, you know, for around five bucks per capita and so on, and, and we're, we're gonna, gonna get closer to 10. And that's out of anywhere from 1200 to $2,400 annual expenditures, uh, five to 10 bucks. It's, uh, it's all less than 1% even after the, the CRD does the change. You can't save a lot of money by getting rid of elected officials. What you really notice though, when you look at the bigger municipalities is the, the province now makes municipalities uh, uh, report the number of employees paid above uh, $75,000. That'll probably go up pretty soon to 100,000, but right now it's 75,000. For each counselor in the Capital Regional District, we got 10 employees paid above 75,000. You go over to Vancouver, for each counselor there's 221 employees paid over 75,000. You go to Surrey, it's 115. But, but more importantly, what's happened, the small number of counselors in those environments can't get involved in all the decisions. It's physically impossible. 
so that, so that citizens are more likely to deal with staff than they are with an elected official. And then when the citizens got a complaint, he probably doesn't know his counselor because the government's so big. If you are counselors around here, you've got to be careful because you go to the grocery store and if somebody's got a complaint, you're going to hear it. They're, they're, they're different political cultures. In other words, the culture that's evolved here is a community-based, lots of elected officials. They cost a little bit more, you know, $10 instead of five per capita, still less than 1%. And they don't hire as many executives, you don't hire as many staff to make decisions. That's, that's what's the difference here. Um, there are things here that, that, that are interesting. There's not a lot of room to save money by getting rid of elected officials. They're cheap, especially if you've got to pay them more in bigger governments and, uh, and they're going to have to have more staff. You also change the electoral system. Elections here are still pretty inexpensive. You know, you go over to the lower mainland and, you know, they're all parties over there now. Their parties spent more than $3 million in the 2014 election. They averaged $220,000 a candidate. You know, you guys are their counselors. You might not be a counselor if you had to raise $220,000. It's a different culture. It's a different, it's just a different cultural environment. That doesn't mean we don't have some problems because, you know, the, we do have problems. And it doesn't mean that amalgamation doesn't make sense because when we look at amalgamations that have occurred in North America where people voted on them and they voted to amalgamate, they tended to work. When we've looked at amalgamation and, and in BC, the, the best example of course would be Abbotsford and Matsqui, not a big one, but they made the decision. We've got some in the US, down in Louisville, other places where they worked out and, and they agreed to, to do mergers that made sense. When the provincial governments have come in and imposed them, they, the forecasts of costs have not been very good. Uh, you know, Halifax had to actually borrow money, go into debt to finish implementing the amalgamation because it ended up costing closer to 40 million than the accountant told them 9.8 million. And they didn't save any money and the rural people took the biggest hit in their property tax increases. That would happen here too, because services tend to equalize. But amalgamations, if you would look, say, at the three communities on the peninsula, if they were together, they'd only be 35,000 people. And you don't change, you can, you can keep the lower culture. You, could, you, you know, we don't have any giant municipalities here. Their question would be a question of culture. They already do the overhead services together. The question is, uh, is Sydney, North Saanich and Central Saanich, do they want to sit on the same council? Or do the Sydney people like the fact that their council can be devoted to improving the harbor? And they've done a really good job on it. And North Saanich can, you know, maybe get some, some non-residential property there on the airport land. But yeah, they already get a nice grant in lieu of taxes from the airport. Uh, and Central Saanich is kind of split because they do almost as much with Saanich as they do with the, the two other peninsula municipalities. And they used to be part of Saanich, but they, they uh, I, I don't know which direction most of the people in, in central Saanich go. But, but there's, nothing, there's nothing in their scale of operation would say, you're virtually going to see no cost differences if you want to amalgamate rather than not amalgamate. You're not going to save a lot because you're already doing your big ticket items together. You're not going to save a lot by a few less politic, public officials because they don't cost much. There's three things, though, that we think that really, and by we, uh, there's a group of us, you know, I, I worked here for 20 years and I come back every summer and I see my friends, and many of whom work in local government. Uh, one thing that's puzzling to me, because I, you know, I work in the U.S. as well as here, and, and I've worked in quite a few other countries, the highway system here has national highways, has provincial highways, has local highways, but doesn't have any, any regional highways, arterials. And that's unique. Okay, in other words, when you, when you build a freeway and you take old Highway 1, you give it back as a local highway. You know, that's a, that's a commuter road. And uh, the Blue Bridge is on a commuter road. The Mackenzie Interchange is on a commuter road. 
it's very unusual not to have a regional arterial system that's actually run by the same government. In the U.S., it's usually the county that runs your public transit because, because they go together. And if you got your public transit and your arterial highways in the same organization as your major water and your major sewer, you got all your infrastructure planning integrated. And, and that, that can make sense, okay? So I would, you know, we're not say do this. We'd say if you're gonna look at bike paths and bring them into the, the transportation network, why don't you take a look at the, the highway system as well? Uh, the, other, the other issue that comes up over and over is the uh, fiscal role of Victoria as a central city. And the research that's been done, it's, it's generally concluded, uh, both in the U.S. and Canada, that the, the high concentration of business property in Victoria, it's got, uh, what, 47% of the business property in the region, and then it uses uh, variable tax rates to tax it at two or three times residential, collects more than enough money to cover the costs of being in the central city. The KPMJ study in Vancouver indicated the business community provided not only enough to cover the costs of commuters and shoppers, but it was subsidizing residential taxes to keep residential taxes lower. But you know, we've got housing problems, we've got homeless problems, we've got extra police costs. We've got costs of a central city and I think it would be worth it to really take a look at the balance in Victoria to see if it's like elsewhere because you can never trust the federal and provincial governments not to download things uh, on municipalities that disproportionately affect what's essentially a central city. And I think, I, we tend to think that would, would really be worth looking at. The other thing that, that uh, makes some of us nervous is uh, simply the internal efficiency of governments. We've got an incredible variety here. Most of you probably aren't aware, but Machosan is essentially the first contract city in Canada. When Machosan was incorporated, they chose not to hire a bunch of employees. They bought their services through contracts. Machosan remains the most frugal municipality in the region <laughs> with the lowest costs. You know, some people vote with their feet and <laughs> live in low-cost jurisdictions. Uh, but I mean, they don't like to spend money. But, but Gary Williams, their first city manager, understood what was possible in delivery of services. We have much more contracting out for services in the Western communities than we do in the core. This is the same as the researchers discovered in California. The new cities were using a whole variety of, of methods to get things produced and delivered. And the old traditional cities were doing it the way they'd always done it and there was a significant cost difference for services between the two sets of cities. That was discovered and published in 1966. You know, this isn't new stuff. But what worries me more than the municipalities is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I don't know anything about these other boards. Uh, BC Transit, I think the idea that you have your local commission and then you're, you're working under some real budget constraints, I suspect there, there's not a whole lot of fat there. I don't know anything about libraries. They go on. When I lived on Cortez Island for many years, we had the Greater Vancouver Regional Library System, had a library in the community hall, and it was used, especially by mothers and kids. And, and uh, I don't know anything about the uh, functioning of the West Shore Parks and Recreation Society. But you know, 5% of the total local government spending, that's a, that's a big operation. It's more than just the one to Fuca Center. But the CRD, uh, I, I know enough counselors now that I really worry about, uh, that's a big organization. It's almost as big as Saanich and Victoria now in terms of its employees. I'd really like to see more performance measures. I'd like to see more way of comparing things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the best ways of comparing things is to contract out part of what you're doing and do the rest in-house. The, the academic research shows that's the best way to get top performance out of your municipal bureaucracies. Compare them. You know, one way is you can contract out some things and uh, the vendors sharpen their pencils every two or three years and they, they're the ones that invest in the new technology 
and, and they will, will do a good job for you. But the other is find a way to compare within the traditional organizations so that uh, you know how they're doing. When Colin Crisp was uh, city manager, I don't know if any of you go back that far, uh, he was commissioning studies all the time on small functions within the city of Victoria to find a way to be sure they were doing better. And they, they weren't expensive, but, but he kept within a highly unionized environment making productivity increases. When Mel Cuvillier was mayor in Saanich, that goes back a long time too, uh, when he discovered Saanich was not performing well in Jim McDavid's latest study of solid waste collection, he had a meeting and, and decided what technological changes needed to be made to raise performance and how he would implement it so he didn't make the union or the employees angry. But you need comparative information and we don't get it in some governments. Now Ontario has started some comparative stuff uh, but it's, it's not easy to do. What you're looking at here, if you know, the research would indicate, frankly, if you want to do a full area amalgamation, it's going to cost you a lot more, especially those of you who are in the smaller communities that currently have relatively low taxes. Um, but but what, what you're looking at most likely is, is what kind of culture do you want in your local governments? Do you want to have low-cost elections? A lot of people know your council members. Uh, they can advertise by doorbelling. I mean, I talked to a guy, the councillor, that, what did he ring? 1,200 and some doorbells to get himself elected, okay? Uh, that's not a lot of cash. That's, that's knowing your community. Uh, or you can go to big and then spend $3 million and buy advertising in newspapers and advertising on TV and advertising on radio as a slate because there's economies of scale in campaigning. And they're just different cultures. They're just different cultures. It's a culture difference more than a cost difference that you have to look at in this region. And uh, that's uh, what I can tell you. Uh, there's no sense us going through uh, <coughs> Uh, a lot of research, uh, you know, we did, we did almost a million dollars worth of research here in the local government institute uh, over a period of time where we were doing the major national surveys in Canada and looking at a lot of other issues including uh, doing most of the organization, organization of the Halifax uh, incorporation study which started before it was uh, amalgamated and it only went three years, unfortunately they didn't finish till five, but five years, but we knew what was going to happen after three. That, what I can offer and then you can ask questions later. Thank you, Robert. Uh, some important uh, things to, to keep in mind for questions later. Uh, so Johnny, please uh, make your points. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Start out with a couple of apologies. First of all, I'm from that other culture, you know, over there, <laughs> over there. And my experience isn't like Bob's from a whole range of different places. Uh, since 1980, basically, I've worked in nothing but Metro Vancouver municipalities, uh, over 20 years as a CAO. And uh, so my observations are from a, a somewhat different system. Virtually uh, in Metro Vancouver, the, the upper tier basically provided the services to everybody. It wasn't the patchwork you got here. So maybe some differences there. And uh, second apology is I was one of those CAOs who for over 20 years the councils tried to get to shut up and failed miserably. And so I tend to go on and therefore tonight, because we want to get to discussion quickly, uh, I'm going to do what I normally don't do and that is stick to my script as much as I can. <laughs> and not go off the topic. So uh, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is, is to start by adding a few remarks uh, as a practitioner in the Metro Vancouver context about what I think the behaviour of politicians is in the context of upper and lower tier governments and, and then spend some time discussing why I think the question to amalgamate or not to amalgamate is essentially the wrong question for municipalities to have asked their, uh, their people. But let's start with the forum title that says some cautionary remarks. And so 
Uh, my first cautionary experience about amalgamation came shortly after the wave of amalgamation swept across Canadian cities. And as the CAO of the last large city not to be amalgamated, Vancouver, I was invited to participate in a forum in Ottawa, along with four CAOs from newly amalgamated cities. As I recall, they were Hamilton, Halifax, Ottawa and Toronto. Uh, and I suspected that this was a, a pro-amalgamation organization that was uh, organizing the event and I was being set up for some combined piling on by the others. And so I approached the event with uh, some uncertainty. But when I arrived at the forum venue, I noticed something odd. I looked at my little tent card with my name on it. It said Johnny Carline, CAO, Metro Vancouver. I looked at the others and every one of them said former CAO. <laughs> Four experienced, competent professionals and not one of them survived more than about a couple of years. And it soon became clear why amalgamation had been promoted with the expectation of great cost savings for taxpayers. And none of those CAOs were able to deliver on that expectation. And we now know those expectations were false. The hope for great economies of scale proved largely illusory. The idea that if you reduce the number of municipalities from X to 1, you could also reduce the number of chief engineers and chief planners and police chiefs and so on from X to 1, proved to be nonsense. If anything, amalgamation brings pressure for more staff, not fewer. Similarly, hopes to reduce staff salaries or levels of service provided by the allegedly more extravagant local municipalities down to a new, more reasonable average salary or level of service proved equally illusory. For quite understandable reasons, after amalgamation, both staff salaries and levels of service tend in fact to rise to the highest level of salaries and the highest, highest level of service provided by any of the pre-amalgamation municipalities. Now, it might be fine for folk to pay a little more to get higher levels of service, but that was definitely not what the amalgamation advocates expected, nor so the public are. <coughs> but more subtle, perhaps, but for me more telling, was the illusion that amalgamation, by eliminating the lower tier of government, would eliminate two tiers of political decision making. Now, I invite you to consider local municipal agendas. They are, as Bob has said, replete with local issues. Neighbor to neighbor disputes, small scale developments, details, details, details. When I worked there in the city of Toronto, the old city of Toronto, the typical agenda ran 400 items. Now you add the agendas of all the local municipalities in a region all together, and it's evident no one political body could possibly process that amount of material in one session. So an amalgamated city has to find some way to offload the really local stuff so that they can deal with the truly regional stuff in an efficient manner. Now, whether they do this by setting up subcommittees with powers to act, or set up new local decision-making bodies, or just delegate the whole darn lot to staff, what they have done essentially is to recreate what they hoped amalgamation would eliminate, a two-tier decision-making system. Now, in my view, Whatever it is, that lower decision-making system, new decision-making system, will never be as good as what it replaced. Because for all their idiosyncrasies, and my God, they have them, <laughs> local, ele locally elected council, maybe even because of those idiosyncrasies, <laughs> locally elected councils deal with local community issues really well. So why destroy a system that functions wonderfully well and replace it with something less wonderful? There's no good reason that I can see 
and I totally agree with Bob's comments on the local decision-making culture and if anything I would actually reduce the size, I would break up the city of Surrey and the city of Vancouver and, and those into smaller communities. But the problem is, and here is the beginning of why I think to amalgamate or not amalgamate is the wrong question, is having, if you do, fight off and reject amalgamation, many people think that that's the end of the story, that the question's been settled. There I disagree. The question we should be asking is not whether lower tier government should be eliminated, they clearly shouldn't, but whether the upper tier governance system is the best we can do. And there, from my perspective, Vancouver background, I got real doubt about that. Because, the fundamental, because of the fundamental reason that currently all municipal members of regional boards, with very, very few exceptions, are elected or unelected solely on their perceived performance in serving the local interests of their local electorate, not on regional issues. And it is quite wrong to think that the regional interest is simply the sum of local interests. That is not true. You've got an example here, Greater Victoria. It's rarely, if ever, seen to be in a local municipality's interest to have a major wastewater treatment plant within its boundaries. <laughs> but it's clearly in everyone's interest that it goes somewhere. Now, you might argue that the majority overruling the minority takes care of those regional versus local conflicts. They'll make a decision. They'll overrule the selfish little thing. Well, you know, sometimes it's true, but not always, as Greater Victoria's just discovered. Now, I'm going to suggest the conflict of interest manifests itself in two ways which systemically undermines the regional interests, those bigger interests as opposed to those really local interests. One of these I call the Tinkerbell consensus building, and the other one is the tragedy of the commons. You may have heard of the latter, you probably haven't heard of the former because I made it up. <laughs> now, valuable consensus building is great, and it occurs when you have a real problem, any solution for which involves some impacts, negative impacts, on a number of parties. And what you do, you obviously gather those interests together and you try and negotiate a solution which minimizes the impacts on them or at the very least allocates those impacts in a way they see as fair. And then you get a consensus, you've solved the problem and there's a fair solution that comes out. Sounds great. But in our two-tier governance system, that translates into a regional director going back to his local electorate to explain that a regional problem has been solved but unfortunately it does involve some costs or negative impacts on his local municipality, on his electorate. And understandably to the regional director who is elected only on his local performance, only on how they evaluate his impact on them, that sometimes doesn't look too smart. And this is a smarter alternative in what I call Tinkerbell consensus building. And that's the process which seeks a solution which hurts absolutely nobody, but still looks and sounds like a solution. Now, how do you do that? Well, I'm going to take affordable housing as an example, but I could easily use air quality or climate change, and I will refer to land use after I've dealt with the, the example. Now, if a local municipality wanted to take direct action to create affordable housing, it might create its own affordable housing corporation. Toronto did that. Vancouver did that. Or it might introduce zoning systems with density incentives for private developers to build affordable housing. You can get this much density, but if you give us affordable housing, you can get a little bit more density. Use the profit incentive as a lever. But those very likely involve costs risks, financial and political, and almost <laughs> certainly controversy. The alternative is for a municipality to make a declaration of its support for affordable housing, in principle, <coughs> or sign a petition directed to some other level of government, 
or set affordable housing targets without an implementation strategy, or repeatedly survey just how many homeless people there are to demonstrate concern. These are all low-risk political actions, without, if you like, any direct action at all, and sadly often enough with no useful result in terms of actual affordable housing construction. And where it has no useful result, it's a Tinkerbell consensus outcome. It's a fairy tale. The characteristic of a Tinkerbell consensus outcome, you can always tell it, is when all is said and done, there's been a lot more said than done. And it's not necessarily the refusal to, date, to take direct action that offends. I mean, there may sometimes be really sound reasons for not doing those concrete actions at the local level. It's the fact that the Tinkerbell consensus outcome too often are pretenses for action that disguise the fact that nothing actually is being done. And a bitter example for me from uh, Metro Vancouver was the Livable Region Strategic Plan. It was their original, it was the very first regional growth strategy done before the legislation was in place. And I'm sure the staff intended it well, but over the process of negotiation, anything that looked like a tooth in that plan was extracted. And it finished up a toothless and, in my view, worthless document. Over the years it was in place, I cannot think of any single action that a municipality did or declined to do that it wouldn't have done or declined to do without the plan. And it is not just the fact that it didn't really achieve very much. The galling thing was when it came to replace it, and we announced we intended this time with legislation to produce a regional growth strategy that actually had teeth that actually required people to adhere to the policy. Oh my God, why would you do that? We've got this livable region strategic plan, which is so wonderful because it had been touted and vaunted. I mean, the, 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 the directors would come. I used, to, I used to compare my directors with those people who go to church on Sunday and compete with each other as to who can say the catechism the loudest and then go home on Monday and sin all week long because they've had their redemption on the weekend. You know, kind of, they, they would just be, they, it was very important to them to promote this liberal region growth strategy because it gave them the freedom to do exactly what they wanted once they went back. And so it became a barrier to actually doing something that actually addressed these real issues. I'll talk about one of those in the second manifestation of the local regional conflict of interest, which is the tragedy of the commons. And that's named after those English peasants before the era of field enclosures who overgrazed the common lands with their sheep, even though they knew full well the harm it would do. Because they reasoned as individual peasants that if they were to cut back as individual with their flock, some other peasant would just expand his correspondingly, and no one would be better off, and they'd be worse off. So everybody just kept on grazing to the level bound for tragedy. A modern parallel in Greater Vancouver was the conversion of industrial land to condos and shopping centres. Everyone knew and acknowledged that this industrial land was vital to the economy. But in the absence of a strong regional government regulation, virtually every municipality allowed great tracts of it to be converted because residential and commercial development yield more taxes, been more attractive to residents, i.e. voters, and often came with sweetness provided by the developers, off-site facilities, off-site amenities. The resultant depletion industrial, in industrial land in Metro Vancouver actually led the Metro Vancouver Port Authority to start buying farmland as potential backup industrial land for the port. And in my view, had we not had the ALR in place, municipalities would have done very much the same thing in converting agricultural land to residential and uh, retail. Finally, our current system where the regional body is entirely composed of locally elected officials involves enormous transaction costs between levels to try and reach decisions. And that's a fact I don't think most of the public really know, just how much effort goes into making a single decision when you've got, in my case, 21 municipalities to satisfy. 
And ironically, and this will play to what Bob was saying, in the seemingly very democratic system that we have, it seemed in the Metro Vancouver context that it took strong regional bureaucratic leadership, sometimes with strategic political alliances, sometimes assuming an overt political role for itself, to begin to address those problems of Tinkerbell consensus and the tragedy of the commons. And as Bob swore out, that raises a whole bunch of other questions about whether that's appropriate. So I'm suggesting that a strong regional government is necessary, but that the status quo has major structural defects, but amalgamation isn't the answer. So what are the alternatives? Are there alternatives? Well, there are, but many of them are also undoubtedly flawed. For example, disentanglement was a popular philosophy in Ontario for a while. Disentanglement suggests Every level of government should be directly elected, each have its own pre carefully prescribed sphere of responsibility, and here's the crucial point, each would focus exclusively on its own sphere and never interfere in anybody else's. This it was thought would be efficient and guarantee the avoidance of conflicts between levels. Well, of course, life doesn't quite work in conveniently compartmentalized packages. Decisions at one level of a government affects other levels and they fought just the way they always used to. And so it didn't work. In fact, I'd, I'd say the urban planning process in the 1970s was essentially redefined precisely because regional governments tried to do transportation planning without regard for what local communities felt. Changed the whole system. So disentanglement didn't work. Whatever system we have, it has to have some kind of cross decision making between regional and local levels. Now I'm not going to stand here and pretend I know the answer to what the difficult problem is. What is the right structure to have? I don't. But I think it is critical to get past this amalgamation, good or bad phase of discussion and really try to identify ways to discuss ways of improving the two tier system we have. Because if we don't, the flaws in our current system will eventually come back and bite us and we will get amalgamation one day out of sheer frustration and I think that would be a pity. So I'm hoping you're going to take up that challenge to discuss that and to at least try to avoid the charge of I've just presented all questions and no suggested answers. I'll close my remarks with a suggestion for your discussion that I heard from a UBC prof some many years ago. What if we considered some mongrel form of regional government comprising some directly elected people, some representative of lower tier municipalities to maintain that vital cross communication. And here is the original and controversial point. Some folk elected or appointed not on a geographical constituency basis, but on an area of interest basis, such as business, labor, environmental groups, arts, culture, education, health, even seniors, youth. That would be a different form of democracy for sure. And maybe the devil would be in the details of implementation. God knows how you do it. But I ask, would that bring something like the needed balance between local and regional interests, between area-based perspectives and truly functional-based perspectives? Would that, could that be a system that might move us towards a strong yet sensitive, efficient yet democratic, principled, yet action-oriented government, regional government. I don't know, but I commend it to you. It might be one of the things for you to consider in the discussion, and I will certainly be interested to listen to your views. Thank you.